Hey guys, welcome back. BDC Care here. We're back with our weekly Q&A videos. This is season 11, episode 4. I say videos, it's kind of dual format. You're probably watching this on uh, YouTube if our metrics mm -hmm. are correct, but it's also on a lot of different podcasting platforms that you can access by checking out the links in the description. We should probably update that because Anchor's been taken over by Spotify. Spotify. Yeah, but it's still, uh, the RSS feed is still anchored on Is FM. it still? Yeah, okay. it is. I haven't checked it in. I don't know how to. Yeah. yeah I'm not uh, that tech savvy. I'm tech savvy in different ways with hardware, but not as much with. Yeah, the it's interesting. Even newer apps. ones at, that happened after the buyout, yeah. uh, it's the RSS feed that it assigns you is still anchor.fm okay. as the, the URL. Yeah. Okay. And this is season 11, which I like to call the season of the Lost Challenge characters because we are doing all the challenge characters that have not been in the cycle since May 2020. So that's, ooh, that's almost four years now. Three yeah. and a half years. So today we're looking at Gaslight Batman. Yeah. And what what team are we being treated with today if we're on the uh, video version? So it's Gaslight Batman, Rebirth Raven, and Hawkgirl. And I think, I do want to say again, I've said it a bunch of times, I want to say again, the more I use them, the more I feel that Hawk Girl, Rebirth Raven, and Red Lantern Hal Jordan are underrated S tier challenge characters. Okay. They are. They can make a team basically out of anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, you're seeing that here where in the sequence of challenge characters, we basically use two of those three as sort of the base and add whatever challenge character we're looking at to really make the most of them, to optimize them. I mean, there's a possibility when they have in-universe teammates that have more synergy that they could be better. Yeah. But hot diggity, this is, they are really good uh, characters for multiplayer. Yeah. Yeah. So all the things that make Gaslight Batman annoying to face make him useful. Uh, so look at some of the stuff he does, right? So he only does a tiny bit of damage over time when you tag in against him. And it looks worse than it is because we're so used to some characters with damage over time that's kind of spectacular. Like Arkham Knight yeah. Catwoman, she does damage over time on you. I think you're a few breaths away from being knocked out. Mm -hmm. So it looks worse than it is because you still got, get the, um, the animation for the damage over time. But what's more important than the damage over time is how it works. It stops Master's Death Cart from giving the opponent power. Yeah. It interrupts it. It stops Rebirth Raven from stealing your power. Um, it stops tag and passive effects. So Cassandra came back, girl, Luchador Bane. It's it's wild. Like I, until yeah, I start it's, playing, it's it's utility, yeah. not sort of the number like value of damage that it's dealing. Right. And until I made myself play with him more, I, I used to dread when um, facing an Arkham Knight Batgirl team mm -hmm. and having to plan around, okay, so who's going to knock her Arkham teammate out so that when she tags in, whoever's standing in front of her will survive long enough or mm -hmm. be able to do something about her. And it, this protects against it. So when she tags in after you've knocked out, or not knocked out, when you've reduced her teammate down to no health, one health, and she's coming in to save her teammate, she won't stun you. So when you set up Gaslight Batman to be your main damage dealer, like we have in this team, and you're fighting an Arkham Knight Batgirl team, she'll save her teammate. Yeah. But you're not going to be vulnerable. You'll still be... So one of the strategies that's really viable, I, I think that at the, there's a couple of fights with an Arkham Knight Batgirl team in the video that I'm going to be using as background for this. But one of the strategies you can use then is make sure that whoever is knocking out Batgirl, or sorry, knocking out Batgirl's teammate, um, if it's going to be Gaslight Batman, you could just try to plan it so that you still have a bar of power. So instead of using special two, use a special one. And so when she tags in, you can lay the boots to her. Mm -hmm. um, so what's interesting about Gaslight Batman, in addition to that, is that his special two is back end loaded. So there's three main hits. The first is a small amount of damage, but it can knock out the opponent if you lower their health enough. The second hit is a slightly even less damage, 
but it doesn't seem like it can knock out the opponent. And I'm basing that on the um, health bar and where yeah. it looks like the amount of health should easily be removed based on the amount of damage we see when it doesn't get close to the to zero. Mm -hmm. It does. It just never knocks them out. A uh, third hit can knock them out, obviously. Like, that's the last hit everybody does. So what's nice about it is that his special two is flexible enough that you can use that as your strategy for facing Raven or John Street Green Lantern to bypass their health trigger. Yeah. Right? Because it's... I, I can't remember what Green Lanterns is, but um, Raven's was like 20%. So it, the last it can easily do more than 20% of her, da uh, her health as damage. And... You can make sure you don't land in it by um, don't swipe too much on the first part of special two, mm -hmm. and then you max out the tapping second mini game. And because it's back and loaded, um, you save yourself the grief of triggering a passive. Yeah. If 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 you're smart enough to remember, unlike me, where I, I forget sometimes, and I'm just. Uh... <laughs> but part of it is I think when you play a character enough, you get used to not only just their rhythms, but you also get used to the kind of little quirks that you have to consciously think to do to play differently than other characters. Yeah. Right. So you got to kind of get into a bit of a rhythm with them. Right. So learning curve. Unusual for a Batman skin, his secondary effect of special one is bleeding instead of stun. I think there's only one other Batman that has that secondary effect. I think it's um, Batman Ninja Batman. Mm -hmm. I feel like stun would be better only because I'm used to it. The amount of bleeding is pretty negligible but it allows for inflicting boosted damage and especially when mm -hmm. you've got um a teammate like rebirth raven where you know we're planning on her tagging and stealing the opponent's power you're doing specials that really gives you a nice boost yeah on uh, the damage she does yeah damage is always nice and you don't need to do anything to play around it whereas with stun you do need to have something in mind to really right. take the most use right. of it either your gear Right? right or you know knowing that after you use a special you're going to swap out and use somebody else's special to yeah. make sure it's unblocked something like that so i feel like maybe my not frustration but the the way i feel about it where i'm ranking a little bit lower has a lot more to do with what i'm used to than it is with how good it is because it, it seems like it's working really well yeah and what's what's nice about how little damage it does is that against a flashpoint uh sorry not flashpoint blackest night flash team yeah you're not actually giving them um when they have flash you're not giving them a lot of uh, power generation or health gain that's true and so you just all you're doing is boosting the amount of damage you're giving them a little bit of boosted power gen but not enough that it makes the fight too difficult yeah it's almost like a status effect more than it's like damage over time right right in execution so there you go and before we get into our sort of first question of the week you wanted to briefly mention something you've been playing a bunch of Catan <laughs> recently all right, so it's interesting to me. So I grew up in a generation before Settlers of Catan. I mean, it was introduced um, maybe when I was a teenager. Like, it came out when I was... Or I was young. I was... It was not popular. We were used to traditional games like Monopoly and Trouble and those Milton Bradley games, right? Yeah. And what's amazing to me is... So I've been playing Settlers of Catan asynchronously on Board Game Arena with a bunch of friends. And I'm really enjoying it more than I did before. There's something about playing a game and not being constrained to a specific time and having to finish within a certain time Yeah, that makes it more fun and more, more frustrating at the same time. It's both more and less of a commitment. It's less of a commitment for each individual action that you're taking, right. but it's over time, like a, it's a longer yeah. commitment to continuing to play. So what I find really frustrating is... Like there's certain things that I know I, I have a I think I've got a reasonable grasp of assessing the situation and positions. Yeah. But the random roles make such a difference to the outcome that I find myself maybe stewing a little bit too much about because you know, some people get busy, they they're not necessarily playing like yeah. right away. And I find myself thinking about it too much and taking a lot of my mental bandwidth. You're ruminating. I am ruminating. Yeah. I'm ruminating, but I find it much more enjoyable because, I mean, it, it it's, I can just play it whenever, right? Like, it, as long as I'm not the one who, waiting, if yeah. other people are waiting for me, That's then, great. It feels like, then it feels like I'm just playing whenever yeah, I at want. Your yeah, convenience and leisure. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's both of those things, but I'm really enjoying it. And That's, I, it's like the meme where it's like uh, me 
uh, sewing. Oh, this oh, is really? great. I love this. Me reaping. Oh, dang it. This sucks. <laughs> I hate this so much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I feel the reason why I was comparing it to the old games was that I don't feel like there's a lot of those other old board games that would translate as well because there's not nearly as much um, joy the same way. And it's funny because, all right, so one of the things that the viewers probably don't know is how we play Settlers of Catan in real life. I think viewers don't know that at all. I don't know how they could. Yeah, no. The, so in the old days when we f started playing, we realized that one of the biggest frustrations when you when we play yeah. is that, especially early on when you don't have a lot of settlements or cities, mm -hmm. that um, generating, resource, generating resources yeah. is pretty slow. And moving the robber onto somebody is there's an outsized amount of frustration that comes with it. Yeah, it's that the the sort of things that you can do <laughs> when you're stealing cars from people and sort of blocking their resources. Right. It, what it ends up being is that in the wash, it all kind of balances out, right? Does it, though? I think well, it... Well, you know what? Now that I'm playing... So, all right, so I should... I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but the, the way... The house rules here at the BDCKR household is... Yeah. That when you can, you put it on a, a hex tile that has no settlements and nothing on it. Yeah, you just and try not to screw each other over, basically. You, you know, trade, but we work <laughs> relatively collaboratively. And right. we all are sort and of more so, interested. We're not sort of doing things to our own detriment. Right. But we're trying to move the game right. faster as and, opposed and, to try to maximize sort of right. personal and position. And we make, we make a deal around the robber sometimes that will offer people resources specifically so they don't randomly take one from us yeah and that they'll stay off our tile and it moves really fast but now that i'm playing with people who don't do that it's yeah. interesting how it f changes the game a little bit and it mm -hmm. makes it a little bit more random but not nearly as frustrating as i thought because you know how your resources are slow yeah now think about if each turn took like hours yeah and that you maybe get a turn a day it's a crawl it's a crawl so that the the incremental difference <laughs> From the robber on your tile, yeah. it doesn't feel like it's so huge because there's so many turns where you just roll and then you pass. Yeah, I guess so. But then the only problem with that is when it's supposed to land in yours and then instead of getting three, oh, yeah. two cards in a day, you get zero. That's true. <laughs> your whole day's worth it's of resources. It's just interesting. I, I, I'm enjoying it way more than I thought I would. Yeah. And I'm in my mind, I'm comparing it to the old traditional board games and how poorly they would translate into something like this. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm enjoying it a lot, and it's a nice distraction from playing Merge Boss on AliExpress. Oh my gosh! Yeah. But I figured I learned it. Maybe I'll talk about it another time. If, listen, if anybody else is playing Merge Boss, I don't think they are. If but let let us know in the comments because <laughs> I've just figured out a way to really take advantage of um, promoting your item generators yeah. quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a really interesting hack. You because just cracked the whole thing wide open. I don't know if I cracked it open, but I found a way to make to speed up. A part of the game that's usually really slow okay interesting yeah so you, you can never turn it off is what i'm hearing <laughs> I, you, I, once i get i'm at level 88 now yeah and so i think it it peaks at 105 or something like there's the last interesting. new st store type that you get is at level 90 so it's got to end somewhere soon after that yeah before like it, i think it gives you opens up a new one every 15 levels and then it stops. This is the last one. So I'm guessing that it never gets to 105 to the point where there should be a new ge generator unless they update the game. Okay. Well, good to know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then one thing I'll say is I just finished recently watching um, Nathan Fielder, Benny Safdie, and Emma oh. Stone's new show, The Curse. You were mentioning that. And what I will say is it's it's such a weird show. It's uncomfortable. It is like sometimes genuinely a little hard to watch. But I think it is really effective at, at what it's trying to do because uh, it's, you know, it makes me feel things and it's incredibly compelling. And so for some stuff, I have a hard time knowing if I even, if enjoyed it is exactly the right word. Right. Like the finale has, it's bizarre. Like I, I don't even want to, I can't talk about it at all without spoiling it. And I think ideally for the curse, you want to go into it relatively like uninformed right knowing a, as little about it as possible except that it's a you know fictional show um from from nathan fielder benny safty and and starring those two and also emma stone um and so I, I found it really interesting and really compelling and i keep thinking about it 
which is to me an indication that it was cool and good right yeah. um but the fact that i have a hard time saying that i i like really liked the show is interesting i feel like i want to talk about it it's a show that i feel like i i have like it it, it it gives me thoughts and and feelings and ideas uh which is usually the mark of of good sort of art okay the way you described it reminded me of something i was trying to look up and i couldn't find do you yeah. remember that magician derek del gaudio who did this they, they filmed his show uh that he did in the theater that was just it had this funny oh, story uh, in remember. and of itself or something i can't remember what the name was yeah in and of itself you're right oh Actually, i was right yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah in and of itself and it's exactly the same thing. Like, there's times when I was watching it where I felt completely lost. I had no yeah. idea what he was trying to do. Mm-hmm. But there were moments where I realized, holy crap, he did these sort of setups yeah. that made you feel things so strongly. And it was moving in a way that I really didn't expect. Yeah, it was like a, it was a one-man show. Yes. And, yeah, so it's that, that's a good sort of comparison, yeah. Uh, but so it's, a, it's really, it's interesting... And cool and unique and kind of stressful at times and uncomfortable. And there's a lot of ways in which it sort of um, skewers and sort of satirizes the the people involved in it. And yeah. there's moments where it's, again, to me, less clear exactly what I'm supposed to be taking away from it or what they're right. trying to do. Right. But it really is kind of edge of your seat watching. Right. Um, and... So I don't know. It's this yeah. isn't even exactly a a recommendation necessarily because I don't think that kind of show is for everyone. Right. And by not for but, everyone, but, but, I mean but no. But it, I, I get... also need to be in the right mood to watch that kind of sure. thing too. So like, it's not even always necessarily for me. I've always felt that that was the strength of Roger Ebert when he was doing reviews is that he wouldn't necessarily recommend every movie, but he would tell you enough about it without spoiling it that you'd know whether it was your type of movie or not. Yeah. And I think what's cool about the way you described it is. I'm now more interested in it because sometimes there's certain sh- media yeah, where I really want to know what's going on and understanding is a pivotal, par- pivotal part of my enjoying it. And then sometimes where if you're just able to let yourself go yeah. and be in that moment, then there are things that you can enjoy about it without having to follow some bigger storyline. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, like Andor, I was saying earlier, right? That when I, when I was watching Andor the second time around with you, yeah, that there were moments in it that hit me so differently and effectively. And it was almost better yeah. on the second viewing than it was the first time around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, Cause I think what's interesting is that the actual plot of the show mostly is pretty easy to comprehend and follow. Yes. Right. Yes. There's no scene where I go, I have no clue sort of what happened there, or whatever, but it's more of almost a way that there's, you have uh, like language uh, like a cinematic language and media language and these mm-hmm. you have these sort of tropes and understandings of story structure and everything mm-hmm. where there's a lot of times where it wasn't entirely clear to me what the show was supposed to be about right right where right. it was going right there's a lot of these elements of it where i'm like you know there's a lot of plates in the air and you spend some time in like these really weird scenes like without doing any spoilers there's one scene a lot of cuts are very long uh, and seemingly maybe like almost like drawn out, right? So right. you're seeing them or scenes go on for like a really long time. And it every a lot of most of it really, the thing I know for sure is that I feel uneasy and that I'm supposed to feel uneasy. This is what right. they've tried to do. Right. Uh, and sometimes the secondary thing is a lot less clear. So there are scenes where I go, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why they're doing this and then you figure it out and sometimes the answer is satisfying and sometimes it's not and then sometimes you know the thread seems like it might be important and then it seems like they drop it or whatever and there's all these sort of little stuff like that where i'm just like i don't really i don't know what i know some of the messaging they're trying to do right Right. some of it's very clear it's um you know the whole framing narrative is uh it's a uh couple Mm. right a husband and wife who are trying to make a show for HGTV about mm-hmm. sort of cult flip philanthropy, and they're doing sort of house flipping, but mm-hmm. it's supposed to be for for good, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of it is sort of satirizing and skewering that sort of like white liberal kind of we're gonna make things better, and right. especially the way that sort of attracting you know 
attention and eyeballs and centering yourself in those narratives and all right. other stuff like that, right? Can right. Uh, it, it's like people who who think they're good people or want to be good people or are trying to be good people, right. um, or at least are projecting that image and sort of the so it deals a lot with sort of image and celebrity and right. and in the same way that a lot of Nathan Fielder's projects do, right? Because Nathan for you was very much sort of a satire of reality TV, right? right, right. By pushing reality TV to its most absurd. And sort of seeing how other people who knew that they were on TV but didn't know sort of what type of TV they were on, how they could be pushed just because there was a camera in front of them, right? right. And so it, this is sort of um, a a narrative version of that that is entirely fictional. But it's, it's again, it's interesting. It's a compelling piece of media. If you like Nathan Fielder's stuff, I think it's probably worth taking a look at. If you're the kind of person who likes sort of thinking about their shows and... Mm the kind of person who likes sort of that media analysis breakdown stuff in general uh and sort of likes looking at their their stuff and chewing on the media that they consume after right, it and don't right. mind feeling a little uncomfortable or right. uncertain or, or weird about what you're watching right mm-hmm. then i think it's worthwhile to watch and uh again not for everybody i i would not always be in the mood for that kind of thing right because right. one of the things that i actually quite like you know, I like prestige sort of dramas. I like dramedies. I like all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also really like trashy reality TV because uh, sometimes you want to be able to just turn your brain most or all the way off and just but, watch something. See, I th- and I feel like that's a self-deprecating way of talking about because some of the the reality TV show, and it's not really reality so much as yeah. I, I like the, I prefer the term unscripted because it feels more accurate. Yeah. Is that you? Maybe you don't have to think. Well, sometimes they're just not fully scripted, right? So I think there's still something there that's not necessarily about um, rational intelligence, but there's something there about looking at how things interact. You know, like almost like you you have um, an ant farm. You know how yeah. some kids would play with an ant farm and put different ants in there mm-hmm. to see if the fight and see like the action stuff. I feel like some of those unscripted reality shows are that kind of thing where you get to see stuff happen without some sort of overarching storyline that somebody's created and decided this is how I want my story to be. Yeah, no, that's true. I think there's still, you know, value and stuff to get out of reality TV. I guess I'm just sort of um, self-deprecating because there's that sort of negative perception of reality TV. But I I don't think there's uh, necessarily... I mean, any media can do damaging and negative things. Yeah. And with reality TV, I think the main issue is the way that they treat the people on it, you know, yeah. as units of, of narrative and the way that they, instead of um, sort of creating storylines from whole cloth and right. writing them and scripting them out, yeah. uh, the way that they sort of nudge people or edit around to make right. people look a certain way and they still try yeah. to sort of build characters yeah. and narrative from real people. Yeah. And so it's both the mistreatment of people like explicitly in the filming of the shows, but then also in a larger context, the way that they mistreat people by how they portray them and represent them in the show uh, is often the, the the issue with it. And then obviously there's sort of secondary like messaging, like the worldview that they right. are uh, suggesting and supporting with the show. But uh, broadly, I would say that, you know, reality TV has the same capacity to be good, bad or neutral as a lot of yeah. other as, yeah. as almost any other sort of genre yeah. in terms of like the value to the audience, right. even though it often, I think, is pretty uh, manipulative of the people. Oh, on sure. It. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I think a lot of this, it has to do, though, with how relatively new as a subgenre that kind of television show is, because a lot of things when they're first introduced, movies, television, um, there isn't that same kind of critical appreciation for it yeah. until there's been both a maturing of the medium Mm-hmm. but also maturing of the sort of critical apparatus it's used to take a look at it, right? Like, I, another example I think was comic books. Yeah. Right? As the people who appreciate it, like, it's, it was always looked at down at as a, as a juvenile form of um, media. Mm-hmm. But I think as the people who enjoyed it when they're growing up um, get older and mature, there's just a bigger sort of mass of people willing to look at it Um not necessarily critically, but without making that sort of base assumption that there's no value to it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so there we go. Do we want to maybe... Do... I think the first few questions are actually all related, which are, are, are nice. Yeah. Uh, the first two, we think, or... Yeah, what? yeah. Uh, one, two, three. Maybe, three. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there we go. 
Uh, so the first question comes from Joseph Budden, 3150. They say, I'm a new player, have about four gold level 50, and I have 260,000 credits saved up. Should I buy Challenge 5 as I don't have Hot Girl? Uh, uh, I'll answer this first, and then we'll tie them all together, maybe? Okay, sounds good. 100%. Yes. Every Challenge character that's available to you, if you don't have the character that you need... And all you're doing is buying out one ladder. Yeah, uh, keyword one, right? Because as soon as you get to more, it's yeah. a harder math to do. It's but. a different math, but I think if it's more than one, it's usually still worth it. But if it's only one, you would because you need to unlock it to be able to buy it for credits later. Yeah. Challenge characters in general are very good. Even if they're not the best, you can still make something good out of them. Yeah. And um, you'll if you don't this time and you want to wait until they come around the next time, you're going to be waiting uh, 43 weeks, so you'll be waiting almost a year. Mm -hmm. So there we go. The next one comes from Joseph <laughs> Budden. Uh, or, no, sorry, that was the first one. The next one comes from Ehu Edits, uh, 07, and they say, how to get Hawk Girl easily, please, can anyone help me? So the it's probably a related question because that's the required character, right? Because there's different skins to Hawk Girl. They are available in the challenge pack. If you look at a straight up buying out the challenge ladder versus um hoping that you get her in the challenge pack yeah the math is terrible for the, the math is pack. terrible however if you've got the patience you don't have you have enough for one pack but you don't have enough for um although that math is weird right because it's you only need 200 the difference is not a lot if you have enough for the pack but you don't have enough to buy out the challenge yeah um you just need to, to grind a little bit more Mm -hmm. But you could also try to save all your money and do the airplane mode uh, slash refund glitch. Yeah. And I, mean, and I think that playlist. actually makes sense if uh, your plan is to buy a couple of challenge packs. Yeah. And so if you're buying like three, for example, and you're going to spend that money there anyways. Yeah. Uh, then the math makes a little more sense to sort of reset and just you need one yeah. copy of Hawk Girl as part yeah. of that three. If you're only buying one. Yeah. It's it really your depends. time is your way time. better spent grinding on the balance. Yeah. yeah especially because you're not really going to enjoy the reset process. Right. The same way that you'd enjoy, like, actually just playing. Or, ne never mind enjoying it. Even learning as much. I feel like That's that true. the grinding I've, I've done, the ground, grinding I've ground, yeah. the grounding that is is crucial um, to my appreciation of the game. And it's, I mean, maybe I'm looking at it the wrong way, but it's. I think it separates us from a lot of the other channels that did glitching and um, cheating. Yeah. Because they were using it as a reason not to engage with the game at the level that the game required. Mm -hmm. And we used it as a way to enjoy more of it. And we were still grinding a lot, but we also accelerated our progress. Yeah. Um, instead of just skipping the progress. Yeah. So there we go. Yeah. And then the last comment, you kind of already alluded to this comes from uh, Zuhair Saftar. 3791 and they say how much would it cost to buy the whole last section of challenge fights the one you need a hawk girl for do you think i should just try my luck in the challenge packs and so, so we kind I, of talked well, around it well now. i would put it to you that joseph budden 3150 actually alluded to the answer even better because joseph budden had mentioned hey i've got 260,000 credits yeah which so, we know is enough right because the the injustice mo mobile sub or not mobile sub or the wiki yeah. Uh, link in the description actually lists the costs of each ladder in the challenge, depending on what level you're playing at. Yeah, the wiki is such a great source of information, really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, compared to, you know, a lot of wikis for, for games, it is so detailed to, like, right. just a It's useful extent. for people who not just play the game casually, but people who are really interested in getting to the, the sort of nuts and bolts of it. Yeah. Some things, I think, could be worded a little bit more clearly. There's some ambiguity sometimes when I read it, and the only reason I can pull out the information that I need is because... I have enough experience to know what they're talking about. Yeah. But, I mean, for something, like you said, for what it is... Still pretty it's exceptional pretty as a resource. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we know that it's less than 260,000 credits. It's 250,000 credits. There you go. Yeah. So that's the answer to that question. And I think this is about as good a time as any to end off for the week. So to finish up, we'd like to give a huge thank you to our patrons on Patreon. That would be uh, Michael DeVries, Irving Ruiz, Hoshi127, and Nora Klimek, who are supporting us on the credited level. And you're going to see a few other names. And they were people who have been kind enough and generous enough to support us at some point during the pandemic. Yeah, so there we go. 
Thank you so much for your support, and thanks so much to all of you for watching. We'll see you next time. Komoda. Komoda.